Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is inspired by my new hair color. Somewhat recently I dyed my hair blue and I thought it was high time that I should make a dress that matches. But first I had to go on a little trip. I picked up a friend and some fabric and even some matching accessories. Together we picked a pattern, altered it, and tested it. Then there was some clipping, some stitching, and to my greatest displeasure, some reading, and then some more sewing. Despite some distractions, and some delirious rambling. Why do you keep putting marshmallows on your fabric? It all came together, and I think it came out pretty cute. Though I think that serves as a great summary for what this video is. If you'd like to see more details on how I constructed this, as well as more photos of how it turned out, then I hope you will keep on watching. Now, as I said, I did have to acquire some fabric that matched my hair. So I picked up my friend Morgan, and we went to Joanne's, where we spent several hours searching through the stacks of fabric to find something that coordinated. And though I'm going to be making a dress to match my hair, Morgan's going to be making a dress and then matching her hair to it. Sparkles go with every hair color, right? Yes. I ended up finding this glitter fabric that I really loved as well as this super pretty brocade and I put up a poll on Instagram to have you guys vote on which one you liked better. Morgan did the same with a bunch of different fabric options that she found and though she posted a lot more options her results were a lot more conclusive. My followers weren't quite as helpful as I ended up with a 50-50 tie even 24 hours later. Once we had made our selections and picked up some matching notions I decided to take her to a local vintage shop where we could pick up some accessories. I ended up buying a hat as well as a cute pair of earrings that match the lighter blue colors in my fabric. So after several hours in Joann's, this is what I ended up with. This is a brocade, and I really like the weight of this. I think it would work really well for the pleats at the back. This one is a really annoying weight, and it will stretch, but it will not bounce back, so you have to be very careful with it, and I did also pick up a coordinating fabric to flatline it with to hopefully make it less annoying, but it's also super sparkly and so pretty, and I would really like to work with it. With all of the materials for this project acquired, I guess I should talk more about the project itself. We knew from the get-go that we wanted to follow a 1950s pattern, and there were a few specifications, like it having sleeves and a relatively full skirt. I pulled a couple dozen options from both my stash and my boxes of patterns in the basement, and we spent about an hour narrowing them down until we decided on this one. We both gravitated towards this because of the interesting dark placement, as well as the overall flared silhouette and the back details. We also really liked that it had the option to incorporate a contrasting fabric underneath the bust, as well as two different tones or textures of fabric by making the bodice out of a different material than the bottom. And that's actually what I ended up doing. This was heavily encouraged by Morgan, and since I basically forced her to buy glitter fabric, I thought she deserved to have some say in my project as well. I am just combining the bodice and sleeve front for view 2 with the bodice and sleeve front from view 1. So they have the neckline of view 2, but with sleeves. So I'm just folding the higher neckline underneath and then matching the edges that do align and pinning them together. So the bodice for view 2 and view 1 were combined. This is the mock-up we have pieced together and uh, the only change we made to this was adding half an inch to each side seam on both the front and back. So it is about two inches bigger in total. And we also ignored most of the back assembly instructions because we're not fussing with that for the mock-up which we may end up regretting. I really hope you guys can hear me being licked aggressively by my dog in the background. She's so cute. So this is the mock-up on me. The bust line, I think is where it's supposed to be. And I've got a little bit of extra room in the waist, but not too much. It is a little bit like puckery in the sleeve region, but I feel like that is just sort of inevitable with Dolman sleeves on a fitted garment. There's Morgan. She's done her hair, I've done my makeup, together we are a whole person. The mock-up was a pretty good fit on me. I did feel like it was a little bit large through the waist, but not so much so that I had to make any major alterations to the pattern. I could just taper it in at the waistline after it was mostly constructed, which is what I ended up doing. So with that done, I could move on to cutting this out. Someone's in jail because they would eat the pattern tissue and they're not happy about it. I hear you growling. <laughs> I'm gonna get it pinned, and then get it cut out, and then get all of these annoying little darts transferred it onto the pattern. When Morgan asked me to pick out a pattern, it's like, I'll pick something really complicated with lots of darts. And I meant it completely as a joke because we don't have a lot of time. And what do you know, we ended up going with something really complicated with lots of darts. And I should also mention that I'm using pinking shears to cut this out because brocade likes to fray a lot. So for quite a few of the pieces, I'm adding a half inch to the sides. And to do this, I've just left the margin around the cutting line. Like this is the side front edge that has that addition of a half inch. And I accidentally cut that off for the side back panel, which also needs that addition. <laughs> I haven't fully cut it out yet, so I think I can just unpin it, scooch it over a half inch, and then it will be fine. 
but that is a wee bit unfortunate. Thankfully, I managed to salvage this piece, and then the margins could be cut off, and the pattern could be handed over to Morgan for her to cut out for her dress. I'm using a mixture of a Sharpie and chalk to mark my darts, which I know is going to be very offensive to some, but the back of this fabric is blue, and my marking pens that I like using are also blue, so they're not being particularly helpful. It's really hard to precisely mark the points darts using chalk because it doesn't stay in a specific spot. So I'm using the Sharpie to mark just the little dots, and then I'm connecting them all with chalk and a ruler. For these pieces, though, there is a few little points that you're supposed to clip to. There's one here, too. So I think I'm just going to do Taylor's tack there to show where I'm supposed to crease the material. So I was originally going to cut out the glitter fabric and the cotton flat lining for it at the same time, but I've decided I'm actually going to cut the cotton out first, transfer all of the markings onto it because it'll be flatter without the glitter overlay, and then I can use the cotton that I've cut out as a guide for cutting out the glitter fabric. So we'll see how that works. And there are also facings to cut out. Here I am cutting the facings out from cotton and cleaning my workspace like a good little table buddy. With that done, the pattern can be unpinned from the cotton and used to mark the darts. On a project where many of the materials have not taken marking pens well, this has been very satisfying. The cotton lining for the bodice that I just got cut out, I got all the darts marked using a mixture of tacks and little chalk markings. And now I can connect the tacks and the chalk markings. And it's just so satisfying and it leaves behind such crisp, nice lines. I did, however, just connect the wrong chalk markings, which is less satisfying. So I'm gonna fix that, and then I will pin these layers to my glittering material and get that cut out and get them basted together. I roughly cut out pieces of the glitter fabric that were a bit larger than the bodice lining. Then I basted the lining to the glitter material with the right sides facing outward. I tried to keep the basting stitches within the seam allowance so they would be hidden if I was too lazy to remove them later on, which with me is not an unlikely outcome. I also basted the layers together around the darts since they can easily separate at those points and then the darts don't always catch both layers of fabric. Basting stitches are just large temporary stitches that aren't intended to be permanent. Think of it like pinning, but with thread. And for thread, I'm using my favorite pre-waxed thread, which I will link down below. I even got Morgan into it. I think she ordered some on the spot after using it for her bodice. After the layers were basted together, I trimmed the glitter overlay to match the dimensions of the lining. Then I began pinning the darts, making sure my pins went through the chalk markings on both sides of the fabric. This pattern is pretty neat with its dart placement. These three little darts offer shaping over the elbow without the piece itself having to be curved or altering the grain the fabric is cut on. It's also just a nice detail that ties into the darts on the skirt. Speaking of the darts on the skirt, those were pinned too using the same method. And I always pin away from the point of the dart so they will be easy to remove as I sew them. And then I actually sewed them just stitching across the chalk markings. All right, I've gotten all of the darts sewn. So the next step is sewing up the front seam and then sewing on the upper portion of the front panel, which has some gathers under the vest to provide shaping. I've already sewn the running stitches for those gathers and I just have to pull on the loose end of the thread to cinch it down to my desired width, which will not be determined until after I've seamed together the front panels. Right now I'm trying to figure out the back seam and the instructions for this are a little bit complicated. It wants me to do some stay stitching, which I'm ignoring as per usual. Then it says, based along pleat line and seam line. Ditch along seam line between small and medium dots as shown. So this is where they want me to sew. It's just like literally a half inch. I have no idea why they want me to do that, but I will do it. And then I guess I'm basting along the pleat line, which is marked with chalk, but also says seam line, which I guess would be up here. So I think I'm just gonna baste it all and then figure out how to accomplish this pleat underlay that they have going on that looks complicated. We also didn't do this on our mock-up, so how it goes together is sort of a mystery. <laughs> so I've moved on to the pleat underlay, which is this piece right here. And they want you to pleat it from the outside, which is unfortunate because I marked the pleats on the inside. So I'm just using pins to transfer them to the right side of the fabric. And then I'm going to pleat at the pinpoint and press the pins towards the center. And then it wants me to base the folds down. And since I'm procrastinating going upstairs, I will probably actually do that. I did do that. Morgan informed me after filming this that I provided zero context for why I was avoiding going upstairs or going upstairs at all. My sewing room is pretty small to begin with and like 90% table, so it doesn't have a lot of space for more than one person to work. And my dog also likes to throw hissy fits when she is contained in my sewing room 
and she likes to steal things when she isn't contained. So we were working downstairs where there was more space for us to spread out. And unfortunately my tabletop machines were having problems with both the fabric and broken bobbins. So I decided that I would use my industrial upstairs to do the majority of the construction for this dress, which meant I was constantly running up and downstairs every time I had to sew a seam. And why didn't I want to do that? Because I'm lazy. So the front seam has been sewn. I finally made my way upstairs and I gathered down those front sections that I used a running stitch gather down earlier just to make sure they were the right size to fit between the notches on the top edge of the skirt panel. So now that is pinned and ready to be sewn. I'm probably going to sew it as a 5 eighths of an inch allowance and then sew a quarter inch away from that uh, just to prevent fraying since the brocade really wants to fray. Over here I have that pleated back panel. I basted the one side, I got the little inset pleated and then I basted down the folds of the pleats and I've just pinned it in. So I'm going to fold the back panel out of the way and just sew the seams together and then I'm going to fold all of this out of the way and sew from this point to this point but not sewing across the outer layer fabric. I realize that doesn't make a lot of sense because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me either but I'm going to do my best and hopefully you seeing me do it and me doing it will lead to some sort of positive outcome. So I think I've sewn that how they wanted me to sew it. It was actually not nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be. I was looking at it from this perspective because this is what they showed in the illustration. But what you can actually do is fold it just like this and then sew individually across that section. So it's really pretty easy to do. I say that without having removed the basting stitches so it could look absolutely terrible when I open those up, which is what it is now time to do. So I will remove this line of basting stitches and we will see what is exposed beneath and hopefully it looks good. All right, so that looks pretty good to me. And eventually this portion will have the basting stitches removed so it'll flare open too, and provide lots of volume. But I think I'm gonna hold off on doing that until I've sewn the side back seam just because it will be easier to press that without this flaring open and getting in the way. So I guess that will be the next step. That was, in fact, the next step. So here I'm doing just that, just pinning the pieces together. I matched the notches first, then pinned from the top edge of the material down, using excess material at the hem, and I will be sewing these seams from the top edge down for the same reason. And you can actually see me sewing said seams with 5 eighths of an inch allowance in this footage. While I was at it, I also sewed the facing pieces together at the shoulders. That seam was pressed open, then the bottom edge was pressed inward by a quarter inch. And then on my next trip to the sewing machine, I stitched that edge down to permanently secure it. I got the side back seams done up, so the basting stitches here can now be removed, and then I will have two separate sides, and one of these pieces will be sewn on to each side, and then eventually there will be a zipper sewn between them. We are both slightly bamboozled by this extra little bit of fabric sticking up. It's also kind of funny because from this side, now with all my basting stitches removed, you can see that little tiny like half inch section they ended up sewing by machine and then the rest of this edge was just basted. And it totally makes sense given the design and it worked out just fine, but it is still so funny to me that you have to sew this like tiny little half inch long seam. So now the back pieces are sewn together, both the upper portion and the lower portion together are now one. Unfortunately, this doesn't line up. It's like an eighth of an inch off and then it's slightly off here too. So I don't know if that was a cutting error. Uh, clearly it was a sewing error, but the brocade is so prone to fraying, they don't really want to rip it out and re-sew it. I think it will cause too much harm to the fabric. So I'm just going to leave it as is and hope, I was going to say no one notices it, but I've pointed out, so now you have to notice it. And I'm just going to sew up the shoulder seam, which I'm not supposed to do according to the instructions, at least not until much later. But since I screwed up on the facing already, I'm, I'm kind of ignoring those for the time being. But I will return to them shortly. I guess I should explain what I did wrong with the facing, and I'm going to insert a photo of the instructions here. They basically want you to seam the facing onto the front and back bodice panels first, and then sew up the shoulder of the facing at the same time you sew up the shoulder at the bodice. I found this sort of odd. Morgan thought it was done this way so it would be easier to alter in the future, but I think it was done this way because there's a relatively sharp point at the shoulder and you can get that point much crisper if you do it this way as opposed to sewing up the shoulder seam the facing and then sewing it all on at once. So after constructing this, I do realize why they did it this way. I just goofed up a little bit when I was following this and didn't want to have to rip anything out due to the delicate natures of the materials I was using. Here I am pinning it around the neckline with the right sides facing each other. And I'm also rambling about how my pattern weights look a bit like marshmallows, according to some YouTube comments. Sometimes I've had people in the comments ask me what the marshmallows are that I use for fabric. <laughs> and every once in a while I see them in the camera, it's like, hmm, sewing marshmallows. Like, why do you keep putting marshmallows on your fabric when you're cutting things out? Like, you know what? A snack. <laughs>
I didn't film sewing the facing on, but it was stitched on with a 5 8 of an inch allowance. Then the seam allowance was trimmed to a quarter inch using pinking shears, and the seam was understitched. Understitching is done by folding the seam allowance to one side and stitching a top it as close to the seam point as you can. This encourages the fabric to fold inward at that point, which is handy when sewing facings that are supposed to turn inward. I took it a step further since flappy facings are an ultimate pet peeve of mine and stitched the lower edge of the facing to the lining of the bodice. And I also rambled more about marshmallows. I just love the idea of someone who's not familiar with sewing watching one of my videos and being like, God, I really wonder what those marshmallows are for. They use them so often and thinking that like giant marshmallows are somehow featured in the dressmaking process. That is all I filmed on day one of our sewing extravaganza, and now it is on to day two, where I was really hoping to get this dress finished. So this is the stage I got the dress to last night. Even did up the side seams. However, there's a little error in one of the side seams that I have to fix, and I feel like I didn't end up sewing the skirt seams very straight, because it is quite heavy at this point, and it warped a bit. I also neglected to do the zipper before sewing up the side seams, and actually with vintage patterns, they usually have you doing the zipper as one of the last steps, and I generally am quite against that because it's much more difficult to do when the fabric isn't flat, but I just assumed that was what they had you doing in this one, so I didn't even think about it. Or maybe I did think about it, but I wanted it to hang overnight uh, so the skirt could warp and it could be trimmed and hemmed today, and I thought doing up the side seams would help. I feel like it was a combination of things, but I thought these things like eight hours ago, so I cannot clearly remember. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rip out the side seams, I'm gonna sew in the zipper, and then I will re-sew the side seams and report back. Okay, so I ripped out the side seams, and this is the seam I was talking about fraying a lot, like seriously so much. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to stitch some seam tape over top of it, about a quarter inch away from the edge, and then even just by machine, I can top stitch the other edge of the seam tape down, and just in case that raw edge. And I think that's going to be fine, because there's a band that goes around the underbust that should hide that stitching. And then once that's done, I can go ahead and sew in the zipper, which I have been procrastinating for most of the morning. Are you sure you don't want to film the voiceover while you're here? It's the most pleasant growls in the background for my audience. Okay, so I've sewn in the zipper. I basted it first, uh, and I basted it quite thoroughly. I also folded the facing over top of the zipper tape and hand stitched that down before sewing in the zipper. So the stitches securing the zipper would also secure the facing on and just offer double protection. So now I've sewn up one of the side seams and I'm about to notch it and press it open. And then it wants you to machine stitch on outside of dress close to seam line on each side of seam. My dog's just coughing up dirt in the background, don't mind her. I'm not sure how this is gonna work because I think they want you to press the seams open and then you're not actually reinforcing the seam. There's still just the same amount of thread securing it together at that point. So this is the curve underneath the arm and as you can see, after it is clipped and pressed open, there's just this line of stitching securing it together. And if I sew on each side of that line of stitching, it's not doing anything to reinforce it. So I think I'm going to base down this little piece of bias binding and then stitch at those points and this will secure the layers together and hopefully prevent strain from wearing it down over time. I did that on one side off camera, then I pinned up the remaining side seam and stitched it with a 5 8 spin inch allowance. I did make the seam allowance slightly wider towards the hem, following a chalk line since the fabric had worked slightly out of shape. And it was back to resolving the weird reinforcing instructions. Alright, so I've now done up the other side seam and I clipped the curve and then I just basted that little piece of bias binding to it. And over here I have done that and then I've also stitched around the seam allowance like they want me to, around the seam point rather. So this is nice and reinforced, it's got a layer of material underneath it. So even if the stitching in the seam breaks, there'll be that top stitching to the bias binding securing it. I took the waist in by about one inch, then moved on to pinning in the waist tape, which is just grow grain ribbon. They instructed you to pin the center of the tape to the waistline, which I marked by notching the waistline when cutting the pieces out earlier on. So this was pretty easy to do. Then I just tacked the top and bottom of the waist tape to every dart and seam, tying off my thread between each tacking stitch. Now it's time to trim the dress with an underbust band, but I couldn't find a fabric that I really wanted to use for this, either in my stash or in the pile of things that I purchased from Joanne. So I decided instead to use some lace for my stash and position this underneath the bust line. The lace didn't perfectly match, it was sort of a sea foamy greeny tone as opposed to a pale blue. I decided I would incorporate colors from the dress into the trim by using a ton of beads and sequins throughout it. I pinned the lace on, then actually secured it on at the same time I was beading on top of it and around it. And this ended up adding a little bit of sparkle to the project, which of course I love, and it's just a cute, unique, very me detail, which I also appreciate. 
Now it's time for finishing touches. A hook and eye was sewn to the top of the zipper, and the cuffs were hemmed. I did this by sewing seam tape a quarter inch away from the edge, then clipping any threads that extended beyond the tape. I used the same method for the hem. Here you can see me sewing the tape on. Then the top of the tape was whip stitched down. I'm saying tape, but for the record, this isn't sticky. It's effectively just rayon ribbon that doesn't warp. You could do the same thing with bias binding or twill tape. Before doing this, I trimmed the hem to be level, and trimmed off the 2-inch addition I added to the bottom of the skirt pieces when cutting them out. This pattern runs very long. I've gotten lazy towards the end of today. It's gonna be like half narrated in the moment, half voiceover. I feel like when you just skip one clip, you can be like, sorry, my dog was barking, which is usually true. But when it's like, so, it's been five hours, um, surprise! Now all it needed were decorative buttons for the sleeves. I wanted to use coverable buttons made from brocade to incorporate it into the bodice, but the fabric was too thick and I couldn't set the buttons because of it. I tried covering them by hand using whip stitches to secure the brocade to the underside of the button forms, but it looked really bad, so I ended up using some vintage buttons instead, and I stitched sequins and beads to the center of each one to make them a bit snazzier. Here are the mostly finished dresses in all their glory. I think they look very cute together, which makes sense because they are cute. And speaking of looking cute together, look at us! Turn around and look at me looking cute. Yeah. I paired my dress with some accessories from the vintage shop, specifically a feathered hat and pale blue earrings. It was worn over a long line bra, girdle shorts, and a very fluffy petticoat. What I didn't consider is that these foundations are different than what I wore during the fittings. I switched to these because they are lower cut, making them less visible under the dress. But unfortunately, they really messed up the fit of the dress. The dress was riding up the waist, causing these wrinkles. I don't think it was too small. I think the petticoat just pushed it up, and the waist of the girdle hit at the wrong spot, leading to this. I tried ripping out the waist tape in case that was adding to the issue, but all I ended up doing was snagging the threads of a dart, which had to be repaired quickly by hand to finish photographing it. It looks fine once pulled down, but definitely isn't perfect, and just goes to show how crucial undergarments and foundation garments are for the fit of both vintage and historical dresses. I might be able to play around with the darts and the seam line to resolve this, but looking back on it, I think the issue is that it's too long-waisted for me, which is surprising considering that I'm pretty tall, but I also found this dress was really long for me, despite being tall, so it makes sense for it to be long-waisted too. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot that can be done to resolve that after the fact, except for perhaps pairing this dress with a belt. So between the fit and just the lines of this pattern in general, it's not my favorite thing that I've ever made, but I do think it's really pretty, and I do like how the materials look together and how some of the details turned out. I definitely had a lot of fun making it. I'm not used to sewing with other people around, but it was a lot of fun to have company throughout constructing this, and also to help troubleshoot some of the more complicated instructions. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Before I go, I did just want to give a huge thank you to my wonderful patrons who make videos like this one possible. I'll have a whole bunch of their names on screen, but I also want to give a special shout out to my top tier patrons who are Amanda Amishar, Jamie Denon, Remy S, Mary Kinsey, Vida Termina, Heidi Neiser, Ezra Hargrave, and Jordan Carpenter. These are the credits for December. Thank you so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. And of course, I have to give a huge thank you to Morgan Donner for coming out and spending time with me and putting up with my dogs and my jokes and my terrible driving skills. If you're unfamiliar with her work, you should definitely check her out. Her video will be linked down below along with her channel. It was a lot of fun. I hope you guys had fun watching this video too. If you did enjoy it, giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. And I will talk to all of you very soon. It is hard to get face and rail in shot. Like, so there's your... And it's hard because it's on the other side. But like... <laughs> <laughs> I did it! <laughs> it's a puppy. <laughs> They're helping so good. She's like, wow, this grass exposes so much of your back. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs>